uh, joining us now, Nahid C.M. Deust. She is assistant professor of Middle East and media studies at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, and uh, Nahid, um, we are supposedly, my understanding is, on day two of a three-day strike. Um, just uh, tell us what what you know about that, and then we will go back to sort of the, the origins of what we're seeing in Iran and, and, and assess uh, w- what it could mean for the future. Sure. Uh, so today is Shunzah Azar, which is the um, National Day of Students in Iran. It's a historic day when students rose up against um, Nixon's visit, actually, during the Shah era. And because students were killed at the time, it has become this historical Students Day. And it's it's actually day three today. And what we saw today across the country, as we have over the last two days, is students gathering in universities uh, all over Iran and chanting slogans and also people gathering in Tehran Azadi Square, the Freedom Square, um, to chant slogans for the Woman Life Freedom Movement. It's it's fascinating to me that this is a holiday that started where there was protests against the Shah, who, of course, was deposed by, I guess, the beginning of, I mean, the uh, 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 Ayatollah Khomeini, and this is the extension of that regime. Uh, and these are two sort of disparate regimes, um, but yet the the sort of, I guess, the, the essence of this holiday remains. That's right. I think what we have to understand about this freedom movement is that it's really the continuation of a century-long freedom movement in Iran, which started with the Constitutional Revolution in 1906, when Iranians gathered to call for the disbanding of the monarchy then and for a constitutional monarchy, they succeeded in doing that. And in fact, the, this movement is very much sort of, uh, you know, compared to that one because of its leaderless nature. Um, and then, you know, throughout the years, the, they didn't um, achieve their republic. Uh, another monarchy took the place of another one, the Pahlavi instead of the Qajar. And then, of course, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi became, a, you know, the sort of pillar of American imperialism in the Middle East. And so the student protests against the Nixon uh, visit in Iran established the students as this center of protest and the center for upholding this freedom movement. And they really have retained that uh, that sort of, you know, that position in Iranian history. So from the 1950s onward to today, throughout post-revolutionary Iran, against the Shah in the 1970s, um, they were a main reason for why, you know, from both abroad, the, the sort of exiled expatriate students in, in the U.S. and elsewhere and students within Iran were at the forefront of bringing about the protests against the government, both in pre-revolutionary Iran and um, since the 1979 revolution. Well, well, there's a little of a of a of a of a, of a tangent, but, but why is that? I mean, because I, I'm thinking in terms of like you know protest movements around the the globe, and it's I don't feel like it's they're they're that they're that consistently located in one cohort, and particularly when you would imagine like this is not you know this uh, people go to school for for a limited period of time, and then they then they're out of school. Like what what is it about? The um, is it the university system? Is it is it uh, something cultural uh, in terms of like the age? What is it? Why is it that? Why is protest so uh, consistently uh, centered in um, among students? So as much as students are at the forefront, I just want to point out that, you know, this has been a very widespread protest, which has brought in vast segments of society, whether it's, you know, the women have been also on the front lines, um, the workers, teachers. Um, so segments, all segments of ordinary people, all segments of society have been part of this protest movement and have been traditionally too. But students have been really leading it because they are Iran's youngest and brightest. Um, Iran's university system is famously very good, both pre-revolution and post post-revolution, Iran has one of the biggest brain drains in the world, many of them leaving to the U.S. to join some of the best universities here, whether it's Stanford or MIT. And so these are Iran's youngest and brightest. And more recently, um, you know, during the reformist movement in the 90s, and uh, again now recently, uh, students, when they rise up, Iranians really give them their backing because they know that if it is their youngest and brightest uh, standing up for freedom, for justice against, uh, you know, complete impunity by the government, they are willing to back that. And so they've sort of taken on this mantle of um, a sort of, you know, wisdom, if you will, that is trustworthy and uh, worth backing. 
My understanding, too, is that uh, outside of just students, some of these protests are sparking in Kurdish regions in the country as well. Um, what's the significance of that uh, in addition to the, the whole student element? Yeah, Emma, that's an important aspect to mention because, of course, the woman who was killed, Masa Gina Amini, um, the 22-year-old whose death really sparked this revolutionary uprising, she was Kurdish. And so the first, uh, although the first protest really was right in front of the hospital where her death was reported, but ignited uh, the day after at her funeral in Satez, a city in Kurdistan. And so other people across Iran and Tehran and other major cities rose up instantly in solidarity um, you know, with the protests against her death in Kurdistan. And so what's special about that is that this is the first time where we see different ethnic minorities, different segments all across Iran really expressing solidarity with each other. So far, we've had several protest movements in post-revolutionary Iran, right? We've had the student uprising in 99. We had the green uprising in 2009, which was really a, an uprising for reforms. Um, and we've had strikers by uh, by workers and so on. But this is the first time where we see in the slogans themselves, um, protesters in Tehran expressing solidarity with protesters in Kurdistan and in Baluchistan, protesters in the north at the Caspian, the Gilakis, um, expressing solidarity with the Azaris, the Turks. Iran is a big ethnic patchwork, right? So this notion of Iran being a land of the Persians is, um, is a myth. And Iranians themselves know that. And they're very proud of this very diverse nation that they have. And so the significance of that is that, um, you know, uh, despite sort of the government's attempts to sometimes draw, uh, you know, characterize protests in certain, uh, you know, minorities and uh, ethnic regions as being sort of separatist movements, Iranians now within those regions themselves have expressed solidarity with others across the country and expressed their allegiance with, you um, you know, the Iranian nation and their Iranian identity. So the reason this is important that we have all these different groupings come together and express the same goal, which is um, a change to the political system. Uh, well, uh, I want to get to that last part as to what the what kind of change they're looking for. What was the context in which um, it, it, that a um, uh, Amini's uh, death would spark uh, this type of uh, of uprising um and 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 be that it we're seeing this type of ethnic solidarity that may have not been there as obvious in the past right so it may have been there it just hadn't really sort of percolated um so visibly to the surface in part because you know um the the minorities hadn't really dared, they hadn't really had the courage to rise up to uh, the way they have this time around. And this is because, you know, the worst repression has happened within those minority regions, whether it's the Arabs in Khuzestan in the southwest of Iran, the Kurds in the northwest, the Azaris in the northwest, the Baluch in the southeast, uh, the Lors even in the central plateau. Um, so because of the uh, more extreme uh, repression uh, that has been imposed on the minorities, they haven't really had the courage to rise up to the extent that they have. But the, it, it was a sort of, you know, um, uh, a loop, uh, sort of feeding loop effect where they rose up in Kurdistan and instantly people rose up all across the country in solidarity. And that really gave them a support and spirit to continue their protests. And also in Baluchistan, where every Friday people have gathered um, after Friday prayers to express protests. And, you know, a, a large number of the people who have been killed by the regime in this very revolutionary uprising over the last 12 weeks have been Kurds and Baluchis. Um, and so we have to hold on to that fact. Um, but I think it really has been a sort of national consensus that the current regime holds so much impunity. There's so much corruption. Um, the, you know, the sort of the politics of grief and death, um, people are sick and tired of it. And so this national solidarity around that has encouraged and energized everybody uh, to rise up and express solidarity with each other. Has the, the regime been actively doing... Um has the regime had an active strategy to um, maintain some type of ethnic uh, rivalry or or no? Um, and uh, not, not as such, really. I mean, uh, because, again, it wouldn't really have too much hold within, um, you know, Iranian cultural and national mentality because many families are 
uh, you know, diverse. They have their their intermarriages between, you know, Kurds and let's say Persian speakers or Kurds and Azadis. And so it's not the kind of situation like Iraq, let's, let's say, where sectarianism okay. really has been, you know, a, um, a, a successful sort of strategy for some politicians. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about the origins of the morality police, uh, the group that w- was responsible for the death of Masa Amini. Um, the, the, it, to me, from the outside, it seems like a, a glorified, like, street gang that now has legitimacy and has gotten so uh, over a period of time. Can you give us a rundown of that process and, and I guess how the Iranian revolution sparked their existence and, and where they're at today? Yeah, so the uh, the morality police initially used to just be called the committees. And this started a few years into the revolution. In 1983, Iran's hijab law was actually systematized and formalized legally so that all Iranian women in public uh, after the age of puberty had to cover up. Um, and so with that, we, you had these vans and cars going around the cities and um, admonishing or apprehending women who, in their opinion, weren't covered up enough. In 2005, um, the Ahmadinejad government actually formalized this and put the morality police force under the auspices of the police. And so it became much more sort of regulated. It was supposed to go against the sort of haphazard, uh, you know, events that would take place with the committees roaming the streets, which, as you said, were sort of, you know, uh, glorified vigilantes. And so this formalization was supposed to be actually a kind of reform. Um, however, with the election of Ibrahim Raisi, you know, and then we, you, you would see sort of ebbs and flows of that, right? Sort of, do you when a more conservative president like Ahmadinejad would take office, he would, um, you know, promise that women would be apprehended and greater morality would be brought to the streets. And especially over the course of the sort of summer, women would be um, uh, would be arrested and harassed more. With Ibrahim Raisi, who's the most conservative president that Iran has had uh, in post-revolutionary Iran, he was the you know, the a protector of the shrine of the holiest shrine in the country, the head of the judiciary, so very sort of conservative pedigree. As soon as he took office, he said, I am going to bring morality back to the streets, not least because, uh, Eman Sam, over the last three, four years, Iranian women have actually pushed back against the hijab. So we've seen this, uh, you know, what a sociologist called Asafayat calls non-movement. So through not really political organizing, but everyday practices, they had already loosened the hijab laws in the public spaces. So they'd already sort of, you know, let the headscarf roll to their shoulders, not bothering to put it back right away. So across the city, Iranians had seen a pushback against the hijab that was, um, you know, unprecedented, even though they'd done it over the last two, three decades. But the, the visuals of this was really unprecedented to the extent that one would see many women without headscarves. And so he said, I'm going to bring the morality back to the streets. And so the morality police became much harsher against women. And so we reached the point where Mahsa Amini, somebody who was comparatively actually well-dressed, and this was part of the discourse, right? When you see the CCTV footage of her from within the holding ground where she was held by the morality police, she's wearing a long black robe, she's wearing a headscarf, her hair is pretty well covered. Um, that is pretty impeccable hijab compared to some of the women you will see in, in Tehran streets who are barely, who are not even wearing actually a coat and whose hair scarf is more like a bandana. And so that I think really enraged people because they could identify with Mahsa Amini as somebody who could be anyone's wife, sister, mother. She was very, very sort of, you know, an everyday kind of woman um, that everybody could I- identify with and, um, and hence the protests. And, and how did that, like, uh, and you talked about, like, you know, this is a, a movement for, for, for broader political change. Um, and, um, and there's been some discussion as to whether, you know, is this an uprising, a response, you know, that is sort of like limited to that cultural norm or, or, you know, uh, I guess uh, police brutality, uh, or is this a revolution that is looking to wholesale sort of change, um, the, the structure of society. Give us your sense of, of, of what's going on there um, and, and what the political agenda is. So I think the best way to call this is a revolutionary uprising. And I think the aim of it, not because of what I think, but because of the slogans that we see on the streets and the chants and the demands of the demonstrators and protests that we see on the street is um, it's not just about the hijab. Uh, they are calling for the downfall of the regime. They're not asking for concessions. They're not asking for reforms. 
um, they are simply saying enough with this. And, uh, you know, when we see the art and the culture production that's part of it, uh, you know, we see how textured and nuanced this movement is and how it's ultimately a movement and a revolution for life right, for a better future, going against the kinds of repres uh, repression that has been imposed on women's and everybody's bodies, the kinds of regulatory biopolitics of the Islamic Republic um, that have meant that people cannot aspire to live the kinds of lives that they imagine. And so it's a very imaginative and creative movement as well. Um, but for sure, it's, uh, you know, this is not a movement just to, to bring down the morality police or to um, you know, change the laws over hijab. This is a movement for wholesale change. And if you look at the photos and videos coming out of Iran over the last three days, um, although we have to stress that internet is so severely restricted by the government that what we see is a very small per percentage of, uh, of what people are able to send out. You know, you see masses of people all across Iran chanting those very um, slogans for, for the downfall of the regime. So, so they're looking, are they looking for a more secular regime? Are they looking for any type of like, uh, e economic structural changes or is it, is it, is it more, uh, is it, they're looking for something that's more democratic, uh, like where, where does it fall on, uh, uh or is it across all, all three of those silos? I think across it's across all those three. Um, you know, Iranians have now lived through uh, decades where religion, Islam, has been imposed by the running government officially, and um, you know there have been many uh, conversations, and especially on social media, this discourse is rampant among uh, social media users, where they just believe that the Islamic Republic has corrupted Islam by imposing it in a public way and by relying on it for its political capital. Um, and that has both corrupted Islam and it has co corrupted the politics. So they're they're looking for sure if you know if if we live to see another sort of day for Iran beyond the Islamic Republic, that government for sure will be a secular and democratic one if things go well. I guess lastly, would do you have a sense of like what 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 happens next? I mean the it doesn't it it, it seems like it, there the momentum uh, for this has at least maintained, I think, longer than maybe many people would have uh, guessed a couple of months ago. Um, what w w is there a is there a cohort of society that you have yet to see respond that must respond before there is any type of like revolutionary change? Yes, I think, you know, we really see civil disobedience across the board. We see, um, you know, expressions of solidarity across the board. What we haven't seen yet, which, uh, you know, somebody like Erica Chenner with, at Harvard, for example, argues is necessary for the success of revolutionary uprisings or for, for a revolution to succeed is, um, at, you know, internally for us, at least the security forces and the military, military forces to start um, giving up their posts and to... Um, you know, uh, sort of join the movement. It's not clear that they haven't. There have been some reports that, you know, the kind of forces that we see on the streets uh, more recently um, are bodied with m super young uh, sort of, you know, security officers and also older one, which kind of points to the fact that maybe they're going to their reserves. Um, so we're not exactly sure, but we haven't, it certainly isn't clear yet that they have, um, you know, in, in, a, in a significant way, joined the protests. And so that's uh, what Iranians are looking to. And they're calling for that in their chants too. They're saying, join us, join us. You know, this is, um, you no longer can be bystanders. You are on the wrong side of history. I, and I guess, actually, lastly, sorry. Um, the There were reports that the prosecutors have pulled back from the morality police. And it's unclear as to, are they disbanding them? Or are they basically just saying, take a break? Um, is that potentially indicative of maybe trying to let a little air out of the tires so that there is not, um, so that they don't lose the support of the broader sort of, I guess, uh, internal national security state? 
Right. So this came up recently and, you know, it was widely reported across Western media that Iran has disbanded the morality police, which is a big deal, of course. But there was actually a lot of confusion around that. This was not an intentional statement by the Iranian government. It happened sort of in the middle of a press conference where a reporter asked, you know, since the since this uh, the protests have started, we haven't really seen the morality police on the streets. So what's happening? Have they disbanded? And so his response was the same place that you know, established them, has disbanded them. However, soon after that, both that official and others have said, no, we're still going to go about and police the streets. I think what we have to hold on to, Sam, is that, you know, no matter sort of, they're they're clearly trying to figure it out, right? They're trying to figure out to what extent and how are we going to uh, to enforce, more, um, you know, morality on the streets um, because this has led to a big backlash. But I think what we have to hold on to is that for the very first time in its history, the Islamic Republic, uh, has publicly um, stated and admitted that it's trying to figure out what to do about the morality police. And a high official, the prosecutor general, has even said it's been disbanded. And this is due to protesters over the last 12 weeks risking and losing their lives on the street. I think that's sort of the point that we should hold on to, which is they have achieved something, if if not nothing else than a confusion uh, by the state trying to figure out what to do. Nahid, CM Deuce, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.